entrevistas de portavoz me hagan el favor de pasar a ver si no sé si exista alguna pregunta realmente creo que hemos visto en estas cuatro pláticas antes la discusión era si qué tan bueno eres si lo puedes reparar o no lo puedes reparar ahora de antes hace mucho tiempo hemos visto que la situación grasa era muy importante y creo que todas las pláticas fueron enfocadas a, a esto no sé si exista alguna pregunta Luis, doctor Valero, doctor Igamolo, si puede pasar, por favor. Yo, yo les quería preguntar, ahora que se tocó todo lo de la inflación grasa, doctor Valero, seguramente que ha tenido una infinidad de casos, vamos a pensar que en el caso donde bueno, el paciente viene con dolor, toma los estudios, hay una ruptura de mango, hay una infiltración grasa notable, le da tratamiento conservador, no mejor el paciente, entra a cirugía. Mi pregunta sería para usted y para Luis, Luis que presentaste el caso de que lo preparas. Aunque esté infiltrado, la pregunta es, si usted entra y ve que la, que la lesión del manito puede ser reparada una lesión pequeña, aunque ya veo que está infiltrado, si lo repara, o mejor se va a la articulación al tronco articular, al bíceps, algo que sabemos que es lo que le está causando realmente el dolor. Porque Luis comentaba que hay veces que lo sutura para evitar una retracción mayor y que la evolución se entonces la pregunta es si realmente aunque vea que es reparable lo repara o bien que ya hay infiltración únicamente hace algún tipo de descompresión o algo de bíceps. Bueno, eh, no dice la edad, pero vamos a suponer que sea entre 40 y 60 años el paciente. La respuesta es sí, sí lo reparo. Me queda claro que no va a funcionar. Pero te voy a decir por qué lo reparo y, y, lo, y tú mismo te contestaste. Un problema mucho muy importante y bien estudiado, claro, este, la fosa se pasa del otro lado de la, de la, de, 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 del salón, pero que, tienes, que siento que tiene mucha razón en lo que menciona la fosa, es el hecho de que un desgarro, cuando se retrae y empieza a evolucionar, lo que va a hacer es evolucionar y comprometer la porción superior o el dentón superior del infraespinoso. Ese se va a desgarrar y va a jalar, y al jalar, al retraerse, se va a llevar el supraescapular. Y en cuanto se pierda el nervio, entonces enfrentamos otra serie de problemas que van a ser más difícil el, el tratamiento de este, de este paciente. Así que sí, si es un desgarro pequeño, lo repararía. ¿sí? Lo repararía con, con esa filosofía. Y me queda muy claro que tiene un 3 de tutoría, que difícilmente ese músculo va a ser competente. Pero lo que no quiero ¿sí? es que ese paciente progrese rápidamente y que después tengamos un, un problema de, de degeneración de grasa también del infraespinoso, pero ya por un origen mixto, por el propio desgarro y por la lesión del nervio supraescapular. Así que esa sería la filosofía para resolver el problema eh, de un desgarro pequeño. Si yo entro y eh, si, no, si, yo, si yo estudio y tiene eso y es un paciente. Eh, vamos a pensar de 50 años para abajo, que, que ya están viendo desgarros masivos en gente de menos de 50 años y con retracciones y con degeneraciones importantes. Yo ahí lo que entraría sería hacer o un deslizado del infraespinoso y del, del subescapular, que ahora están muy criticados, ¿sí? que sin embargo han funcionado a lo largo de los años. Pero bueno, si queremos estar en boga, entonces entraría con la idea de. de buscar suplementar de veneno si sale de lo posterior superior con un, con un tendón accesorio. Porque además es cuando existe plasticidad cerebral para que el paciente pueda reeducar el consumo. Eso es lo que yo digo. No sé si alguien lo que yo llamo, o usted también que está haciendo para, para este tipo de, de casos. O no sé si existe alguna pregunta.
¿Qué papel le darían, por ejemplo, a, a hacer lo que se está en este momento de, de a lo mejor intentar hacer una cirugía abierta y cubrir el efecto con, con deslizando tejido o con, o, con, o con injertos y o eh, ya iría directo a una prótesis eh, de los Bueno, generalmente en aquellos pacientes que encontramos un cáncer muy grande, masivo, la verdad es que lo que se le haga es una, una descompresión subacromial inversa, una tuberoplastía, una aproximación de, de márgenes, reducción del tamaño del desgarro. Todos reportan que, que tienen un resultado funcional satisfactorio, sin embargo, creo que parte de eso es la liberación de las adherencias que pudiera llegar a tener. También hay que ver qué realmente es lo que le está causando el dolor. Yo creo que antes de pensar en una inversa de tales cosas que se pueden ofrecer a nuestros pacientes. Yo estoy de acuerdo con eso. Eh, a veces entramos a, al logro y vemos una reflexión muy grande, vemos un, un tendón adherido, pero no necesariamente eso significa yo creo que la clave probablemente está en tratar de llevar ese tendón a su sitio y dejar una reparación sin tensión si eso no se puede para mí sí la alternativa de hacer una reparación parcial o hacer una descompresión normalmente nos modelice pues, con la articulación articular de primera intención muchas veces les, les genera un resultado eh, funcional satisfactorio con lo cual podemos llevarnos a tal vez por algún tiempo, ¿no? No dudo que ese paciente va a terminar en alguna otra cosa, pero de primera intención no me parece un mal gesto el hacer eh, una, eh, un tratamiento de este tipo buscando una funcionalidad del paciente sin necesariamente llevar ese tendón a su sitio con una reparación tensa, un tendón que sabemos que no va a funcionar. Hola, buenos días. Eh, yo creo que hay un punto importante. Yo hago mucho a macroscópico y el punto es de que yo quería ver más de la sustancia de los chistes al cero bien. Creo que un punto importante también es eh, evaluar la configuración que tiene ese desgaste masivo. Porque si no evaluamos ese, ese, esa configuración, igual no sabemos preparar. Pues, a veces es una muy buena liberación, como digo Luis, podemos llevarlo sin tensión, que ese es punto importante sin tensión a las velocidades que podemos reparar. Entonces, la configuración es parte importante. La calidad del tejido cuando lo estás tomando con las quinzas y lo estás moviendo es parte importante también. Y uh, eh, la, la asociar a veces el bíceps dentro de la reconstrucción podría ayudar a separar un poquito más esa vez del gran masivo. Son unos puntos que pueden preocupar a la situación. Muchas gracias. Sí, y yo nada más para finalizar. Eh, comentario del doctor Negrete, actualmente todo empieza artroscópico y dependiendo del tiempo y de las lesiones asociadas, el, el bíceps y el bíceps, como dice Francisco, puede ser integrado a la reparación, pero hay algunas ocasiones en donde el bíceps es mejor hacer una tenodesis, especialmente dependiendo de la demanda física que tiene el paciente si voy a hacer la tenodesis, pues mejor replanteo, analizo la configuración del, del, del desgarro hago una incisión para hacer la reparación y a través de esa misma incisión hago la análisis del piso y termino el elemento. Es muy importante la línea que hay entre lo que es un desgarro masivo y un desgarro masivo con artropatía por lesión masiva del mando de los rotadores, que ahí es donde realmente se notan más los fracasos de los tratamientos y la mala evolución que, que de repente se gana la reparación abierta del mando. Yo nada más, mi, mi comentario sería, Jorge, este, eso no nos debe de pasar. O sea, no puede ser el hallazgo operatorio en el momento de hacer el diagnóstico. Eh, eso nos pasa mucho en la institución, eh, en eso estoy de acuerdo contigo, porque tú ves al paciente hoy, empiezas tus estudios y luego la siguiente fecha quirúrgica, en el caso de, de ustedes o en el caso de las como el instituto, como la Secretaría de Salud, que es dependiente de que el paciente pueda adquirir los insumos, pues probablemente pasaron cinco o seis meses. Por, por norma, la vigencia 
eh, y ahorita no recuerdo la fecha exacta, pero una resonancia magnética después de seis meses sirve nada más para echarle gasolina al coche, no sirve para otra cosa. Entonces, no, no, no es, si, si ha pasado seis meses, pues hay que hacer otra resonancia. Y hace que ahorita Pancho está pensando que en el instituto son ocho meses nada más para la dura resonancia, pero bueno, eh, tenemos que buscar la manera de, 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 poderlo, de poderlos acortar. Porque que hagamos el diagnóstico, que, que cuando entremos nosotros, y aquí, como dijo este Francisco hace rato, no hagas artroscópico, lo hagas abierto, y en ese momento te descuentas que se trata de un asilo. Sí, es, es agarrarte el dedo con, con los dedos con la, con la puerta. Yo creo que eso es lo que no nos debe de pasar, y desgraciadamente esa es una de las cosas por las que nos explicamos por qué nos sucede a los que, a los que tuvimos o a los que tienen vida institucional. ¿Sí? ¿Por qué nos llegan a suceder esas cosas? ¿Sí? ¿Por qué las llegamos a ver? Y es por eso. Entonces debemos de volvernos más cuidadosos aunque estemos en la institución y no hacer el diagnóstico adentro. ¿De acuerdo? Y otra cosa que quisiera hacer muchas veces en lo que mencionó Iván. El diagnóstico de artropatía se hace con una radiografía simple, como dijo también Fernando. Esa es la radiografía simple, nada más. Y si ustedes ya tienen datos de artropatía, aunque ustedes vean en la resonancia un desgarro pequeño con poca retracción, etcétera, etcétera, es otra historia. Lo podrán ustedes reparar, le podrán poner manchas, le podrán hacer una configuración en diamante, le podrán hacer una configuración en la que tú gustes. Y ese paciente si ya tiene datos de artropatía antes de 18 meses. Ya está explotando por todos lados la, 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 la artropatía. El desgarro en que se volviera sintomático fue el aviso de la artropatía de decir voy. Y una vez que la artropatía dice voy, no la detiene nada más que la prótesis. Entonces lo que debemos hacer es identificar a los pacientes antes de que comiencen con los años de la artropatía. Ahora estamos atinadamente, este, no todo es una reversa, estoy de acuerdo, pero ¿sí? debemos de ser, de, de, de ser conscientes de que existen otras opciones, pero debemos de diagnosticar los desgarros y tratar los desgarros quirúrgico médicamente antes de que desarrollen la antropatía. Una vez que empieza la antropatía es una historia diferente, eso, eso sí es importante que nos quede o que nos llevemos a casa. Vamos a gracias a los panelistas, vamos a continuar con nuestro programa. Vamos a pedirle al doctor Don Dupont que se que nos va a hablar de la exploración ultrasonográfica del hombro. Él es cirujano de hombro y codo, nos acompaña ya en muchas ocasiones, ha estado con nosotros en varias conferencias. Él viene de, de Dallas.
And I will talk a little bit about coding and financial issues that we have in the United States, but we obviously won't spend a lot of time on that. This is a very busy slide that shows all of the different anatomy that you can see with ultrasound. I won't go through all 11 points, and this is not a complete list, but it is important to recognize that these um, anatomical points are extra articular. Ultrasound is not good for looking at intra-articular structures. And so as a result, you cannot diagnose slap tears, bank heart lesions, label tears, intra-articular loose bodies, uh, degenerative joint disease, or osteoarthritis. All of these things are better diagnosed by other modalities, whether x-rays or CT scan or MRI. But for extra-articular anatomy, ultrasound is fantastic. For orientation, this is a left shoulder, this is a coronal image, and this slide is just to introduce some of the terminology that you will hear if you start to incorporate ultrasound into your practice. Hyper, hyperechoic means white or bright, and in ultrasound, cortical surfaces are the most common things that we will encounter that are hyperechoic. And so what that blue line is pointing to is the greater tuberosity, is the supraspinatus foot mark. And so it is typically a hyperechoic, unbroken line in the normal state. Hypoechoic refers to some area on the screen that is darker, has less echo, less signal. What's interesting with ultrasound is almost the opposite of MRI scan and that pathology and things that we are typically trying to diagnose are hypoechoic on ultrasound. So if there is a tear in the supraspinatus, in this example, this green line is pointing to a partial thickness tear in the supraspinatus. And notice it is a, a well-described hypoechoic circular defect in the supraspinatus tendon. Anechoic refers to an area that is black or without signal. That's anechoic. The most common area where we see this in ultrasound is underneath cortical surfaces. The cortex is a very dense structure, so it reflects all of the ultrasound signal back up to the machine, and there is no signal remaining to travel deep to a cortical surface. And so as a result, everything, all of the anatomy deep to the cortex, with the bone marrow, the intramedullary canal, you don't see any diagnostic information on the screen. It's all black or anechoic. Second term I'd like to introduce, or fourth term really, is anisotropy which simply means that if your transducer is not perpendicular to what you are studying, some of the signal coming out of the transducer will not return to the transducer. So if you look at the image on the left, the transducer here is off-axis. So I keep the thumb in, doesn't quite show, but I keep. So the transducer is not perpendicular. What that means is on the screen, there will be a black area that should not be black. And as clinicians, we can be fooled into thinking that there is pathology where there is not pathology. And the way that you correct that is to make sure that your transducer is perpendicular to whatever you're trying to image. And you can do that in real time just by changing the angle of your transducer, especially as you come over the uh, lateral aspect of the deltoid, for example, if you're looking at the supraspinatus. So here, with the transducer not aligned properly, we cannot see the biceps tendon in the bicep little groove on this axial view. Once we properly align the transducer, the long head of the biceps tendon on its axial view becomes a hyperechoic kind of oval-shaped structure. So for orientation, probably the most important thing to, to learn quickly is that we are simply magnifying a small portion of an MRI scan, since most of us are familiar with MRI scans. We are magnifying a small portion of an MRI scan to create this ultrasound image. So the field of view is smaller, but we're magnifying the tendon. And so the area that is in red, in that red rectangle on the right, which is a coronal MRI scan, if you magnify that, that's what you see on the left on the ultrasound image of a, a coronal supraspinatus tendon. So now with this amount of magnification, you can actually see down intrasubstance within the supraspinatus tendon. Here's another example on an axial view looking at the long head of the biceps tendon. So the MRI scan on the right shows that little black circle that represents the biceps tendon. If you magnify that image and put it on 
on the left, that ultrasound image shows the same picture. You've just magnified it significantly. Once you understand that, you become oriented a lot faster. So the clinical setup in the exam room is very simple. Uh, this is a modality that lends itself to examining both shoulders. Fortunately, most of our patients will have a normal side that you can use as a control. It makes it very easy to make some of these more difficult diagnoses, particularly in situations where there may be a partial fitness tear. Uh, I'd like to be behind the patient and have the machine on the table so the patient can see the screen with me. Uh, patients love watching their bodies on the screen. I haven't had a patient in six years ever, ever say that they uh, didn't want to have that opportunity to see the anatomy. Now we darken the room a little bit because as you see, this modality is really just shades of gray. And so we want the room to be darker so we can see the resolution on the screen. And then you'll need some, some ancillary things like towels or ultrasound gel and it will have it. About six years ago, a, a colleague of mine in San Diego and I developed a 13-point shoulder ultrasound exam. And it's not meant to be the best protocol or the only protocol, but at the time that we developed it, we really felt that there wasn't a protocol that was designed for clinicians, specifically for surgeons. We don't really need to see all of the minute anatomy that a sonographer may, may want to see. They may want to spend 30 minutes evaluating someone's shoulder. I may have five minutes in the office and I'm trying to answer one or two questions. Is the cup torn? Is the biceps inflamed? And so given that, I have designed a 13-point exam that looks at all of the real important and relevant clinical anatomy, but isn't going to have you on the exam room for 45 minutes on every question. So to break it down quickly, the first five points are in the front of the shoulder. So it's very logical. You start in the front, and the two main structures that we see in the front are what you would expect. The subscapularis tendon and the long head of the biceps tendon. So once you know that, it becomes relatively easy to see what we're going to do. We want to look at each tendon in two planes. So we look at the biceps tendon in the axial and sagittal plane. We do the same with the subscapularis tendon. And then the fifth point in the front of the shoulder is where we slide over a little bit and look at the core point. Because that's an important view to look at the core for humeral interval and to assess for any knee pathology or to guide injections from the anterior approach. So that's the first five points of the 13-point exam. The next four points are looking only at supraspinatus tendons. So we spend four points looking just at the supraspinatus because it's so important clinically. We look at it uh, both coronally and, and sagittally, and we divide the tendon into two. So we look at the anterior half and the posterior half in both planes. So we really spend or devote a significant amount of the exam looking at the supraspinatus tendon because it's, it's responsible for so much dysfunction in our patients. And so after spending four points looking at the top of the shoulder, we then look at the back. And there's three points looking at the, the main structure in the back, which is the infraspinatus tendon. It really, in my experience, hasn't been clinically important to look at the teres minor, so we haven't included that in this exam. So we primarily are looking at the infraspinatus. Uh, the 12th point, is an important point to guide posterior injections into the glenohumeral joint. So we've added that, and we'll have pictures of that in a little bit. And then the final 13 point is looking at the AC joint. It's a, it's a good um, point to guide AC joint injections or to look at uh, AC joint arthrosis. So here's some imaging. Uh, point one, again, the first five points are in the front of the shoulder looking at biceps and then subscan. So point one, you can see the horizontal alignment of the transducer. Uh, the patient, or in this case the PA, is sitting with her hand just on her hip and her palm is facing out elbow at 90 degrees, just resting comfortably. Transducer is horizontal across the anterior shoulder. And when it's positioned like that, you can see the deltoid superficially. You can see the, the hill and the valley and the hill that represents the bicipital groove. Within the bicipital groove is the axial view of the long head of the biceps tendon. Once we have that view centered on the screen, you can rotate the transducer 90 degrees, and that will give you point two, which is a sagittal view, or in sonography textbooks, they will call this the long axis view. And so that will give you a nice sagittal view of the biceps tendon. Very sensitive view to appreciate um, bicipital tenosynovitis if there's fluid in the sheet. 
Uh, we have to be careful because if it's fluid in the sheet, that can also happen in a large rotator cuff tear. That fluid can track down the biceps. Point three, we now transition to look at the subscapularis tendon. And so in order to see and to be more sensitive in diagnosing subscapularis pathology, we have the patient externally rotate. So she does this. Because that stretches the subscap, and now we can see if there's small or partial thickness tears in the subscap. So what doesn't show in the picture on the left is that she is now externally rotating. When she does that, you can see these structures as labeled the deltoid first, subscapularis. That's the lesser tuberosity, the, uh, the hyperechoic line underneath the subscap. Okay, that's the lesser tuberosity. Ultrasound magnifies the image so much that essentially the entire screen is the footprint of the subscapularis. So if you were to measure this, from here to here is about 22 millimeters. That's almost the entire insertion, just to give you an idea of the magnification. We'll jump over to point five. What's different about point five compared to the last point is that we move the transducer medial and center it over the cortical. And so now we can see the coracoid, the subscapularis, of course, is deep to that. And if we do a dynamic exam, which we can do at every single point, we can always have the patient move and watch in real time. If you do a dynamic exam, you can see the subscap excursion as it rolls underneath the coracoid. So if you have a patient with anterior shoulder pain, and for some reason you're thinking they may have a coracoid impingement, you can make that diagnosis in real time by using ultrasound. Or you can use this to guide an injection to see if they're pain with away by putting some lidocaine around the cortical. So now we'll go to point six, which is the first point looking at the supraspinatus tendon. One of the tricks to quickly learning how to do this is, is all in patient positioning. You have so many things we do as surgeons, especially as arthroscopic surgeons. So her position is hand on the hip, as far back as she comfortably can, and her elbow is aiding up to as far as she comfortably can. Okay? There are some protocols, primarily in radiology, where they have the patient put their hand behind their back. Virtually all of the patients that come to see us come to see us not because they're in great health, because their shoulder hurts. This usually makes it hurt even more. So this seems to be a nice compromise and uh, puts the patients, especially post-operative patients, if you're looking at post-operative patients, puts them in a safer position and allows you to still get a very good image. So with the patient, um, with their extremity in that position, you then take the transducer and align it parallel to a line connecting the contralateral shoulder and the ipsilateral hip. So you can see the red lines on the slide. The transducer is oriented parallel to that line and just positioned over the front of the shoulder. Okay. That gives us the equivalent of a coronal image of the supraspinatus. And you can see the deltoid, the supraspinatus is between two hyperechoic lines. The first hyperechoic line is the, is the distinction between the undersurface of the deltoid and the superior surface of the supraspinatus. It's the subacromial space, which in the normal physiologic condition does not have a lot of fluid. The second white line, the second hyperechoic line that you see, is the greater tuberosity. So if you see those two white lines and a nice smooth transition down to the lateral aspect of the, of the uh, humeral head, that usually means that the superspace is normal and intact. Switching to the next point, we rotate the transducer 90 degrees. And so now, as you can see, the transducer is aligned uh, parallel to a line that connects the same side shoulder and the opposite hip, that red line that you see. And when you do this, you can see the Biceps tendon, which is the hyperechoic kind of kidney bean shaped circle here. Deltoid supraspinatus. This hyperechoic line here is actually articular cartilage. Okay, that's not pathology, it's not fluid. And the way that you know that is because it's symmetric and it extends all the way across. And it does not extend up into the tendon. You see black or a hyperechoic region that extends up into the substance of the super space, and you have to be concerned that that, that may be pathology. Point 13 now shows us the infraspinatus from a posterior approach. I'm 
sorry, that was point 10. Point 13 shows us the AC joint. And notice we have the transducer just directly over the AC joint. And once you do that, you can get the joint centered on the screen. And that becomes a nice way to do an injection and, and never miss the joint, no matter how old it is, because you can visualize it. And so here are some of the things we use to do ultrasound guided injections around the shoulder. Uh, we can do subacromial injections, biceps tendon, glenohumeral joint, AC joint. We can do calcium barbitage for patients with calcific tendonitis. We can aspirate cysts, even spinal glenoid cysts, for example, and not send those patients to radiology. The question that most people ask at this point is why do I need to use ultrasound to do this? I've been doing injections around the shoulder for 15, 20 years, or like one of my partners, 25 years. And to hear him tell he's never missed one, but the literature would suggest otherwise. The literature would suggest that even orthopedic surgeons who are supposed to be very comfortable with the anatomy and the surgery still miss what they're aiming for with injections, sometimes up to two-thirds of the time. So this is a study published a couple years ago by Brian Cole, uh, who was up at Rush in Chicago. And he showed that by using ultrasound, you can significantly increase your accuracy of your injection. So starting from the bottom at the AC joint, without ultrasound, we are only 45% accurate. With ultrasound, we can increase that to 100% because we can see and actually see the needle going into the joint. So with chromial injections, depending on your technique, um, you saw a significant increase in accuracy from 63% to, again, to 100%. And in the posterior glenohumeral joint injection, you saw a significant increase from 95% uh, or from 79 to 95%. So I always hesitate when I see studies that show 100% of anything. I always worry that it's truly one person must have been missed. But the one thing I can tell you is that there's never been a published study that's shown a decrease in accuracy by using ultrasound. So hopefully if you can see better, you, should, you certainly should not be worse. So I think it's worth uh, trying in, in those patients where there may be a difficult um, stint where we may have large um, you know, in Dallas, we have some patients who have BMIs that are very high. And it's very hard to, to feel any bony anatomy. And in those patients, ultrasound is fantastic for guiding the injection. One of the tips towards guiding these injections is to use the uh, needle and orient the needle so that it's in line with the transducer. When you do that, you get nice images, as shown on this video. You get a nice, high color colored line, a white line, that represents the spinal needle going into uh, the body. And so here you can see how happy this gentleman is. So with ultrasound, the patients become happy even though you're putting a needle in it. It makes it very wonderful. Nobody who's unhappy. So we can do this subacromial injection from a sagittal approach. We can leave the needle tip just above the supraspinatus and we can watch as we inject. There are two basic ways to do the biceps tendon injections, either from a sagittal approach or an axial approach. Both of them are effective. However, my preference is to do the sagittal approach because you have a little more a margin of error. And so here you can see the needle coming down just above the biceps. And as we inject, you can see the fluid dissecting within the bicipital sheet to confirm that you're, you're within the sheet as you do your injection. So this is a nice, quick way to, uh, to do a long head biceps tendon injection. We can also use this to do our glenohumeral joint injections. And those of you that saw me in the gym yesterday got a chance to see all that. But uh, this is what we're trying to do. From a posterior approach, we are basically a little bit lateral to the posterior arthroscopy portal. Okay? The transducer is essentially directly over the posterior arthroscopy portal. And your injection is just slightly lateral to that right at the edge of the transducer. And so I put the patients in the lateral cubist position in the office. You can see my 18 gauge spinal needle goes into the skin just at the edge of the transducer. And then as we do that, see the image. as we do that, you can see the spinal needle coming down. And our target is the labrum. The labrum is that hypericolic structure um, in between the glenoid and the humeral head. And we target that, and once we see that we're within the joint, we can inject. And then in real time, as we get to about 10 to 15 cc's, we can even see the infraspinatus start to lift off the posterior joint as we, as we inject the joint. So the AC joint, uh, this is the one joint around the shoulder where I prefer a direct approach because it's such a superficial joint. 
So we simply get the joint centered on the screen, and then we take our needle straight down, uh, and it's usually just you know millimeters, four, five, six millimeters to get into the AC joint. As far as diagnostic pathology, once you are properly trained, ultrasound is as sensitive and specific as MRI scan in diagnosing arterial content. And this is not just one person's opinion or one study. Now, Levon Mazarian is a radiologist of the United States around Philadelphia. And several years ago, he did a meta-analysis where he combined the results of 65 separately published studies. And every single study had surgery as the proven outcome measure. So they were able to tell for sure whether or not there was a rotator cuff tear, and whether it was partial or full thickness. And what he found was that the sensitivity and specificity for ultrasound versus MR was exactly the same. He also found that MR arthrogram was a little bit better than both ultrasound and mountain contrast MR, which I think what most of us would expect. But the numbers were in the range of 92 to 94 percent for both ultrasound and and plain uh, MRI. And so here's an example for those of you that aren't using ultrasound. Even on the first day that you unbox your machine, you can see this. If you look at the normal shoulder, the asymptomatic shoulder, you see this nice anatomy on the left, and then you look at the other shoulder where the patient is complaining of pain and they're weak and they don't have full motion, and you see this large hypolipoic defect, you can make the diagnosis that the supraspinatus anatomy is not normal and it's torn. The same patient on the sagittal view, you see the same type of pathology. On the left, you see the normal anatomy. On the right, you see the symptomatic side, which is clearly not the same as the left. So the full thickness tears like this are not difficult to diagnose. We're looking for large dark areas where there should not be large dark areas. Here's an example of the interspace tear. Normal on the left, abnormal on the right. These are tears that are, that are relatively easy to see. It's the partial thickness tears that take a little bit of time. And there's been a recently published study that actually showed it takes about 100 exams for a surgeon to get far enough on the learning curve to be comfortable with their diagnostic skills. So that's not much. For most of us, that's certainly less than six months. For those of us that see a lot of shoulder patients or only shoulder patients, that may be as quickly as three months. Here's an example of somebody with a significant biceps tenus synovitis. You can see the fluid around the biceps tendon. One of the things we teach people in our course is the better you see the biceps, the easier it is to see the biceps, the more you should worry that it's pathological. Okay, because it usually means there's a lot of fluid around it, and that's usually not normal. Rotator cuff evaluation after surgery is probably best done by ultrasound, in my opinion, because there is zero implant artifact. There is no problem no matter how many suture anchors somebody put in the humeral head, you can still see the soft tissue. And so here's an example of what happens at six weeks. We're in a single row technique, which is my preferred technique for repairing the cuff. At six weeks, you can see the tendon tissue coming right down to the anchor line. At four months, that tissue is a little bit progressed lateral to the suture anchor line. And the study that we, that we published, it takes about five months for the rotator cuff footprint to be fully restored, even in a uh, single row repair. The nice news is that even in a single row repair, the footprint can be fully restored, which is one of the reasons why I don't do double organization. So these are just some codes and reimbursement examples in the United States. Our Medicare, our government pays about $125 per diagnostic scan and about $210 just to give you an idea per um, ultrasound guide. Uh, I think that's <laughs> So the average reimbursement is $135. So in summary, why wouldn't you want to know the status of your patient's soft tissue healing? As orthopedic surgeons, we all grow up taking x-rays of fractures. We take x-rays every two weeks to follow fracture healing, to make sure there's no amount of unions, to make sure that our fixation is intact. If we have a tool in our office where we can do the same thing with soft tissue, why wouldn't we want to use that same thought process? In my opinion, patients can receive point-of-care diagnosis with significant cost savings. This is significantly cheaper than MRI scan especially when you consider the fact that the patient doesn't have to go to a different facility. At least in our country, you don't have to schedule it and recertify it. Um, you have to include the cost of lost days of work, child care, all the other things that figure into a patient having to go to another facility and then come back to see you to get results. It's also the only modality that you can use in the office that can give us real-time soft tissue evaluation. Thank you very much.